speaker, somebody I, I call a friend, uh, Matt Claypotch, works at Mozilla, where he is a developer evangelist. He's here to talk to us about scratching that itch. We'll see what he means by that, but uh, command line, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Cool. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My mic working okay? Mic's working great? Oh, yeah, I hear that now. Great. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about command line node for fun. Not necessarily for profit, but definitely for fun. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Potch. I'm really terrible at picking recognizable headshots. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have put something with my face up, but uh, I can fix that now. So, uh, hi, I'm Potch, uh, and I am a web developer advocate at Mozilla. Uh, so what I do is I go out and talk about web technology, and I go out and talk about, to, to, you know, encourage people to take closed platforms and open them up, or build web apps instead of native apps, or you know, turn back in and say, hey, we need to fix that feature in the product. Um, I'm actually not talking about any of that today because the talk that got accepted was about command line node, uh, a thing that I do not do in my day job and do do in my spare time. Uh, and uh, I have a confession. I'm a little lazy. Lazy is not the right word. Uh, I hate context switching. I hate being in the middle of one thing and having to go do another thing, um, probably because of some attention deficit <laughs> thing that is as of yet undiagnosed. But I, I, I hate going from this, which is really where I spend a lot of my day when I'm coding, which is 80 columns of terminal with tests and build, and the rest of the screen and editor, uh, and then I have the browser region on a second display or a second space, and having to stop what I'm doing and go look up that function definition for that function. Is it needle or haystack? Is it needle or haystack? I can't remember. I love PHP. Um, I have no problem with that language. I'm building some stuff in it right now. Uh, this talk is a pure, comes from a pure place of love. But sometimes when you're out going to hunt down that exact piece of documentation you need, you get distracted. And you find yourself reading about fictional bears. <laughs> Wikipedia is the greatest resource. This is why we fight right here for the web is so the list of fictional bears will always be preserved. Or even looking up specific references in Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire. <laughs> Rock and Roller Cola Wars. You should take a look if, if you were a little young. Um, and all these distractions really add up. You end up wasting a lot of time in your day. Uh, it, it starts off with, even if you get your job done, even if you complete the task you meant to do, losing 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes. If the documentation is not great, five minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, or if you get distracted, several hours where you come out of a daze and wonder why Doris Day is on your Wikipedia page with seven other tabs open. Um, so what do you do in this situation? Um, if it's a piece of information you know you need all the time, or certain types of information you need all the time, you could try replacing a part of your brain with a simple shell script. And when I find myself in times of trouble, Randall Munro comes to me speaking words of wisdom, XKCD. <laughs> and this is an awesome table. How long you can work on making a routine task more efficient, automating part of yourself before you're spending more time for you, sa you save? Over five years. Um, if you're anything like me and you're constantly just checking small things, you're going to find yourself in this corner of this table. Uh, maybe five times a day you lose 30 seconds, or five times a day you lose a minute you can spend a pretty long time making up that time building a tool for yourself. And maybe even just an hour making a little shell script to go out and check something. Um, you know, curl a website in a loop to let you know when GitHub is back up, back up online, uh, so you don't get too distracted is a great example. Um, and when I think of little tiny tools, I think of the command line. In fact, it's a whole 30, 40% of everything I'm looking at when I'm not in the browser. And there's this notion in you know, command line stuff, especially when you're on Mac and Linux, of the Unix philosophy, uh, which really distills itself down to this acronym. Do one thing well. And uh, what that really means is trying to build a very simple 
very straightforward tool that takes something in that's very clear and outputs something that's really, really clear and constrain that scope down maniacally. And that same metaphor works so well when you're trying to replace one small part of your brain. If you really can only justifiably invest a couple hours of a week or on a weekend taking advantage of a little small thing you can automate, then you want to build something that's small, controlled in scope, and is really kind of always at your fingertips. There's another community that uh, has a similar concept. I'm realizing my slides are not advancing with the jokes. That's OK. Uh, here we go. Uh, this community right here. This is the Node community. Um, and this was an awesome visualization from yesterday's talk. If you didn't get a chance to see it, you should check it out. Um, but it's incredible to say that the Node community has these millions and millions of packages that can stand in for a small part of your brain. And it's just like the Unix community, small things that work together. And it's no surprise that Node is an amazing tool to build things on the command line. That's, that's pretty obvious. Your Node runs in the CLI, and NPM makes it really, really easy to build these things. That's actually what I'm going to talk to you about, is how to find that one small problem that's been nagging you and replace it with a little command line tool. So let's take an example command line tool. And please don't follow along at home for this one. Um, this is uh, the remove tool. It does one thing. It removes things from your computer. And uh, it takes a couple of arguments. <laughs> um, and then it does, it does its work, and it tells you about it uh, on uh, standard out, and if there's any issues on standard error. Uh, I'd like to point out that the I flag puts this in interactive, so you're safe. Uh, you're, gonna ha you're not going to have a bad time. And how do we access this? There's also standard in. It's a stream of input, but a lot of tools that you're invoking from the command line, really, you're taking the arguments right there. And in fact, the contrived examples I came up with for this talk don't have standard in, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. Um, but does Node have an equivalent here? And it does. The uh, process variable, the process uh, module, I guess it's a global variable, uh, gives you access to all these extra little niceties that let you hook back into the command line and back into the terminal environment and do these exact things. In fact, the corresponding things are standard out and standard error. And these are actually really conveniently wrapped as console.log and console.error. Uh, so we have right at our fingertips exactly what we need to do with the most basic interactivity. But how do we get the arguments from there? Uh, the good news is, so we have this argument, and we have this list of things that come after the word NPM. And they're all broken up, split on space, into a list of tokens called process.argv. And that actually returns just a list of all the things you see. Doesn't tell you what order they're in, doesn't really give them a whole lot of meaning, but it gives you access to everything the user typed before they press Enter. So we have all the power we need, and now we're going to go out and build something completely incredible. It's actually probably a little closer to this. <laughs> the goal here is not to build a tool for everyone, not to build this incredible... It's not, we're, not, we're not trying to build the next gulp here. We're trying to build a small, simple thing that's really just solving your problem. Um, it's, it's sort of funny I get up here right after Rebecca says, you know, there's, people have solved most of your problems and you should go out there and find them. And I'm saying that when you need to solve a problem for yourself, sometimes you should build something to have the satisfaction of making it wrap around your headspace. It doesn't mean that everyone else needs to use the same command line tool that you do. It doesn't mean you need to build yet another build environment. But it means that when you're trying to solve that one small task, you can build something that is good enough. And you should, because I think it's a great exercise. So doing developer relations, I find myself in a lot of airports wondering whether the hand of fate is going to leave me there for several more hours. Uh, and I find myself constantly rechecking my flight status. And Google actually does an amazing job with this sort of information. If you search you know, flight and then your flight code, you're going to get one of these amazing one boxes. I mean, if you were here on uh, Wednesday, you actually heard about micro sort of micro transactions and micro copy. And I think actually the airplane progress bar is a great example of that. It's just a little bit of extra information presented in a way that it doesn't have to be presented that adds a little bit of fun whimsy and something that I 
genuinely enjoyed. Um, but all the information we need is right here. But what if we could get all this information on the command line? Um, and I found myself in an airport a while back wanting this exact thing. So I sat down and spent about half an hour getting the minimal solution out. And I just want to show you sort of the thought process I went through when automating a small piece of something I do. So where am I going to get this information? Well, if you zoom out from the one box, you actually see that there are tons of websites that do this exact thing. So I just grabbed the top result. I went straight to FlightAware. And uh, their website is awesome. It's so much deep, nerdy information about flights. If you are interested in the average on-time performance of that plane, it's a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes I just punch random flight codes in just to see what's going on, uh, you know, and try to figure out, is there a pattern to United's codes? Is there a pattern to Delta's codes? The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> but all the information we need to build our own command line one box is over here on the side. We've got our time, our on-time performance, um, and we have that progress bar. We have a percentage-based piece of information of maybe that flight that's inbound, or you're waiting to pick up someone from the airport, and you need to know what, if, how far along the flight is. You have this awesome little piece of information that you can, we can just borrow all of this. Um, we're building this for our own personal use. Just want to point that out. Uh, so let's go crack open the dev tools and see that uh, table-based design is still alive and well on the internet. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, and it's not. So we can take a look in here. And these are, this is the Firefox inspector, but use, use the tools that you like. Um, and you can see that actually, even though this is table-based design, everything is ornamented with all these awesome classes. It's great to see something that is maybe a little bit in archaic in its structure, but they took the time to add all the semantic meaning. Uh, so they we're actually going to have a pretty good time here. Um, so Let's grab that page and take some of that information out. Um, Node has a built-in facility for this. Um, and for really just getting a page, this is more than enough. But I actually thought to reach for a module. I wasn't sure if I was going to need to do something more advanced. And I wound up using the request module. Um, if you're familiar with Python's request module, it's the same thing. It's just one method request. It takes all kinds of arguments and just makes it really, really easy to just interface and grab stuff off the web um, and take care of redirects and all those nice things. So here's actually the boilerplate straight from request documentation. Um, we're just going to give it a URL, and it gives us back a callback. And we have our error and our result, but we also get the body. So we can actually just check to see if there's not an error, and we can just get the HTML body of that page. This is all pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, do we want to parse the HTML? Uh, we definitely do. And we definitely don't want to use regular expressions. There's that great Stack Overflow thread where uh, everything goes off the rails and devolves into Zalgo. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth seeing if you haven't. Um, however, Node again has our back in the amazing ecosystem of packages. We have Cheerio, which is a fast, lightweight, and elegant implementation of the core of jQuery. Um, if I was going to build this today, I actually might have reached for JS DOM, which allows me to inject maybe jQuery right into the page and evaluate things on the fly. But Cheerio is a great solution for if you don't really need an entire implementation of the DOM, but you need to take an HTML string and get stuff out of it. So here's what that same code snippet looks like with Cheerio inside. Uh, we're now just going to parse the body as it's given to us and put it right in that little dollar variable, and now we can start grabbing stuff. Uh, I'm not going to really bore you with the entire implementation of this, but uh, it's a lot of pretty cheesy hacks uh, to get the headers out. Uh, and even with classes, we go through and do some wonderful things like contents first, text, trim, uh, just for pretty display purposes. So we have all of this, and we're going to print it on the screen using console.log. And now we get this, which is uh, a really great little update, but it's missing something. It's missing that little progress bar. So let's go back and figure out how we can make this. Now, if you're like me, you're probably, you're probably using an 80-column terminal. But why should we assume that? Sometimes you know, I'm you know, full screen in my terminal, or sometimes I have a split view. So how do I figure out how wide to make this? So Node actually has our back, yet again, built in. And we can figure out exactly how wide the terminal is. Uh, we actually just say process, standard out. We can ask exactly how wide it is. And it tells us, and that's an up-to-date piece of information. And we don't have to worry about the scary uh, you know, terminal ANSI escape sequence stuff necessary to measure this stuff. So here we have 
a final result. And it looks pretty good. You know, we have all the information we need. We know when it left. We know when it's going to get in, estimated, and we know how far along it is. And we have a little great little Unicode airplane. I don't know if you can see that. I was, I was pretty pleased. Um, so, uh, but it's missing something. I feel like there's extra information here that we're not getting. And yes, there's the terminal and there's the gate, but there's this instantaneous flash of color that tells us things are okay. Before I even read a word, I know that this plane is moving forward. My plan is proceeding as expected. So if you're familiar with uh, ANSI escape sequences because you spent too much time with DOS, you know that this is how you make green text. Um, it's pretty attractive. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and if you remember to reset everything, you're going to be all right. But if you're not comfortable with that, and actually I'm not either. I had to go relook all this up. There is chalk, uh, one of dozens of awesome command line terminal uh, color modules for Node. And you can actually just wrap it in a function, and it spits out exactly those exact same ANSI escape sequences, uh, but in a really nice human piece of packaging. So now let's splash some color all over our thing. We have a little blue sky we're flying through. We've got red, uh, which means this flight is not running on time, even though the text says it's running on time. Uh, that's OK. <laughs> I'm actually not going to debug that, so let that, leave that as an exercise to the reader. Um, <laughs> All these are online. You'll be fine. Um, and yeah, we, it's a really simple. It took, I think, probably an hour, an hour and a half for the in initial implementation. And I made it, wrapped it up in a little tool called Flight Status. And even though I made it for me, I open sourced it because I'm kind of a nice guy. And you can all play along. And I haven't put something in the readme yet. But uh, I actually think, as someone who struggled with the maintenance of open source projects, it's totally OK to say, hey, I'm open sourcing this because someone will find this useful, but I'm not building it for an audience. It, this is code that will absolutely shorten someone else's work, but I'm not trying to build a tool for everybody, and I am not going to be offended if you fork this and change it in any way you want, and even take that code and mark it as your own. I mean, that's what open source is about. I think sometimes we have this weird sense of ownership where we say, well, I put the project up first and you use it as a fork of my project. So the whole source of truth has to be back in my module. Or, peop or if you're contributing to a project, you feel guilty about forking it. And there are tons of politically fraught situations here where people say, why didn't you send this change back up to me? Why are you promoting my project? But I, I kind of like the idea of no of you know, no maintainership intended. Wouldn't that save your time so much if you could, before you filed an issue, see that it wasn't going to get merged? And if you're interested in this code, have at it. And if you want to maintain it for others, please do. I'm not, you know, no maintainership intended. I, maintainership intended. Uh, I think that's something that would make a lot of our lives a lot easier because Node is full of modules. And in fact, if one of you wants to maintain a flight status thing, I will give you that sweet NPM module string. I promise. It will be yours. Uh, because sometimes I fix bugs in this, and sometimes I don't. And I fly United a lot, so uh, I fix the abbreviations for United, but not for Delta. Uh, so <laughs> I'm really sorry. But uh, patches to your own systems are more than welcome. So in preparing this talk, I asked myself, Poch, why didn't you just use the API that was for this site? Uh, and I had to reverse justify why I had done it for the purposes of this talk. Um, and I decided to go with the answer that scraping is API zero. Um, the web is inherently a read, write, remix entity. And just because one website presents that information, so long as they're comfortable with you viewing it, you know. Shouldn't it be OK for me to build a purpose-built user agent, a tiny screen reader that does exactly one thing and goes out and gets that information? Well, I'm really pleased to tell you the answer is absolutely not. Um, at, once I went, as I was preparing this talk, I learned that. With the exception of Flight XML, you will only access the FlightOware website with an interactive web browser and not with any program, collection agent, or robot <laughs> for the purpose of automated retrieval of content. So, your flight aware, I'm very sorry. And I'm going to create an account. 
uh, and use your XML format. I don't think I'm going to do 10,000 requests a month. So if you're out there, I will cease and both desist. <laughs> the other reason. The reason that people tend not to scrape, other than flagrant terms of use violation, uh, <laughs> is that there's the perception that scraping is brittle. Um, what if that website changes? An API is a contract, uh, a contract that for many websites is constantly broken flagrantly. <laughs> and I, I ask, is this really that different than this? I feel like I'm pretty hosed either way. Structure of the websites change, and the APIs are not supposed to change, but they do. If there's an, a an API available, please use it. If, it has to, if you have to enter a credit card information, well, you know, check their terms of use. And if, if it's for personal use and you're not going to make money off of it, try, try your luck. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely post a follow-up tweet if I'm presented with any legal copy. Um, and another reverse justification for screen scraping is that it's a great way to check the accessibility of a website. And this is actually true. A website you can't scrape it just has no semantic meaning where you're writing expaths and doing first child, first child, nth child, first child, last child. It probably isn't really accessible. None of that information is marked in a way that has any meaning. And it's almost a great way to do a Sendly check, which is, can I, could you right now write a 30-line node script that tells you how many Twitter followers you have? Maybe. But if you can't, then maybe Twitter.com isn't very accessible. Because how is another script supposed to parse through that page and tell you anything, and for anything useful? Accessibility is one of those things that I think we're actually all really starting to get on board with. But what is with that abbreviation? A11Y, we really like to abbreviate things. We don't like words longer than five letters in tech at all. A11Y, A, 11 letters, Y. I love playing with these patterns and thinking about these words. And actually, this is, an, <laughs> this is a list of all the words that have A, 11 letters, and Y. Uh, and I can tell you how I got this information, which is I built an abbreviator or as I call it, A9R. <laughs> so let's go into the, the bits and pieces. I don't have a ton of time, but how this, I put this together. Uh, it does two things. You can give it uh, a thing, and it spits out all of the words that match. Or you can give it a random one. It'll just give you one random word for if you're just trying to compose a, a funny tweet, and you just need any one random word. Um, so well, the biggest problem that I had with, with argv is I get random, and then A11Y. But what if I write A11Y random? I hate command line tools where this order blows things up. It drives me mad. If you've ever done like git, I think it's like git add, and you put the P and the dash P in the wrong spot, or the dash A in the wrong spot, it just blows up and yells at you. So you get two completely different lists. You have to write all your own logic, or you can use a tool. And actually, this is I use Heather Arthur's nom nom. This is a, awesome little command line parser. Um, and you just define the schema for, what you're, for you know, your command line arguments. You say, I, want, I have a pattern. I have an option called pattern. And that's the zeroth positional argument. And random, which is a flag, meaning it has no value. If you don't put that, it's going to try to tell you what the value of random is. And then you parse. Uh, and you can see I can just see what the query is by grabbing pattern. And I can tell me if it's random. Uh, so I uh, did do the service of uploading the entire Scrabble Salpods dictionary to NPM as a module. If you ever need just a giant word list, uh, it's all uppercase. So we're going to uppercase our word, and then we're going to see how long our query is. We're going to get the first letter, the last letter, and then parse that number out of the middle. We're going to construct a regex. We're going to filter our entire word list, and we're going to get a list of everything that matches. Um, if it's random, we pick a random index, and we spit out just that index. If it's not, we print the entire list to standard out. Um, I found myself constantly accidentally just typing words, and it crashed, and it's nothing worse than using a command line tool and getting a stack trace. So I did a little tiny bit of validation. We checked that a letter 
digits, a letter, and then we print out on the console error and exit. Um, this is also available. Uh, the one last missing piece for you having a true command line tool is this bin line. Uh, NPM will see that and link it and put it right on your path. And then you can just type A9R in the command line, and it will run your script. Um, when you're developing this, there's npm link, which means right while you're in your project, you type npm link, and it's as if you npm installed this project. In fact, you, if you've ever wanted to do any global module testing or testing in general, npm link is a great way to not have to do the dance of npm publish, npm patch, npm publish, npm patch, and install elsewhere on your system. So what happens is it's just going to symlink our script and wire it up as A9R. So I definitely sped through that last part. But you can see that there's a really, really I love building little dumb things. Uh, uh, there's also a, a great Unicode command line tool I would love to talk to you about where it has the entire Unicode database in it, and it gives you a random character, or you can search for taco and see if it made it into Unicode 8 yet. Uh, I'll share that later. It did. And I think solving your own problems and not worrying about what problems are already solved for you is a really great way to build your skills as a developer. It doesn't mean you need to take what you've learned and make it into the next great framework. It just means that you got to figure out a little contained piece on your own and make something and just close that loop. Get that dopamine. It takes so long to ship things. Make something tiny. Finish it. Finish it to whatever standard of quality you care about. It's only for you. Thanks.